I want to thank Adef for being here, all the authors, you know, the whole uh, Oscar thing, the editor, you know, <laughs> everyone uh, who put up with uh, my craziness, uh, Phil's weird, very busy schedule, and made that book happen. This book, I think, is a reflection of all the contradictions that any Egyptians in this hall would be aware of. It's about the contradictions, real and imaginary, about the boundaries uh, between the supposed opportunities that we have that come up with every form of resistance that we see. Um, the reason being the labor movement that Anne talked about, but you know, a whole series of uh, challenges to the autocracy and the inequality that Phil uh, has been talking about, that we've been living uh, very vividly in Egypt since 2000, and other forms of resistance, I think, that might have went undetected uh, for the past uh, 50 years or so. It's also about the, that supposed contradiction between the research object and subject. Uh, and I'll come to this uh, in a minute. And it's about the contradiction, again, um, hypothesized uh, contradiction between scholarship and activism. Just to be clear about a few things uh, before you just buy the book, if you buy it or read <laughs> it or whatever, uh, we do not claim any kind of the so-called academic objectivity. Uh, I don't think there is something uh, you know, you can be objective in social sciences. From the, the choice of your research question to the choice of methodology, uh, to the conclusions, the interpretation, this whole idea of objectivity, I think, uh, has a lot of <coughs> ideology going on, on for it. So let's be clear about it. This uh, objectivity is not there. I think, um, I know that all of the authors uh, stand strongly against the Egypt that we've known uh, for the past uh, few decades. Uh, whether they're uh, activists, all of the Egyptians uh, who've written chapters here are involved with different kinds of uh, opposition one way or the other, uh, or even uh, the non-Egyptians, who again are very vocal, not only against uh, the Mubarak regime, because I think um, that moment of change we're talking about in Egypt is m about much more than the Mubarak regime. It's about the gated communities that uh, Phil talks about uh, in his book. I mean, every day when I go uh, to AUC where I teach, it's just amazing. There's a flyover over Dar es Salaam that uh, has millions of people living in tiny holes, I would say. Uh, and then you're suddenly transformed to where AUC, where the American University uh, of Cairo New Campus is, which is this amazingly uh, lush oasis in the middle of the desert with gated communities. Everything is privatized from security to the delivery of pizza and whatnot. You know, um, AUC students, and I know some of them are here, uh, go from one gated community to the other in their uh, air-conditioned cars. We haven't reached the helicopter uh, part yet, but I was just talking to friends the other day, and we were just saying that it's coming very soon. Um, I think this is the Egypt that we're talking about in this book. And that's why this book, I think, um, have not looked at democratization or uh, the whole regime and anti-regime politics in a very narrow uh, political sense, being you know the removal of Mubarak. Uh, that's why we think that something like uh, the labor movement has everything to do with the kind of Egypt. Uh, I think uh, we we would want one way or the other, and there is an Egypt again coming back to this whole. Uh, objective-subjective uh, thing. I think there's um, 
in Egypt that we might differ about in terms of details, but all the authors of this volume would agree that at least there are certain guidelines uh, for that Egypt. Uh, and that's where the whole activism scholarship uh, divide is blurred in that book. It's good scholarship, so, you know, yes, do read it, but there's a lot of, uh, I think, passionate analysis <coughs> going on in the chapters. It's also about the contradiction between the opportunities and the challenges that we've been uh, facing in Egypt, particularly um, during the last nine years, since the second Palestinian Intifada that I've been referred to. So on the one hand, it's as if uh, one movement comes out with a certain agenda, it fades away, and another uh, picks up. We've seen this with the Intifada and the anti-war movement, followed by the pro-democracy movements of Kifaya and its sisters, and then the labor uh, movement. And this is in a society where the state has co-opted every possible source, potential source of resistance during the past uh, 50 years. Uh, this is a state that became so entrenched that you you get into a cab and the cab driver is a mukhtar, is a police informant who tells you that, of course, madam, what are you talking about? Every single Egyptian has a fine. We only decide when to use that fine. And this becomes, uh, you know, accepted common conduct of how things are run. So to imagine that those kinds of movements uh, erupted in Egypt during the past nine years, I think uh, that's very hopeful, uh, to use your word. The thing that, yes, a lot of those movements, just to be you know, honest about it, have not realized uh, what they were looking forward to. I remember I <coughs> spoke in that same hall uh, three years ago, and my expectations of what Kifaya and the pro-democracy movement uh, was heading towards were wrong. They were wrong in the sense that, yes, Mubarak is still there, and the whole different scenarios for having his son take over might be happening, but I was completely blinded to the potential of such a strong and vibrant labor movement that Anne was talking about. Not that this uh, labor movement is going unchallenged. There are so uh, many problems how the state has been uh, increasing its pressure on that <coughs> labor movement after sort of giving in for a while, for a few uh, months, there's been uh, a lack of reservoirs of resistance and organizations for this movement uh, to build on, and hence um, those, actually all the different movements have had to start from scratch or reinvent the wheel. I mean, compared to other places um, in Latin America, for example, where there has been a long history of struggle that recent movements can build on in Egypt, this has been completely absent for 50 years. So to find a number of resistance movements coming out, involving <coughs> having different causes and, and involving um, different age groups and different social backgrounds, I think is uh, something that's very hopeful. What's not hopeful, actually, is and I think that this is a, re a realization that I only <coughs> recently uh, came to, is the complexity of the challenges that all uh, the movements are facing. The complexity of that moment of change that we're talking about. I think when we, um, when we talked about the moment of change for the title of that 
book. It was meant to put forward our own wishes, as I said, of the moment of change. But I think uh, what it also means is that that's a very complex historical juncture that we're looking at and that this um, country and that society are going through. It's not as straightforward as uh, an autocratic regime putting uh, pressure, people resisting, you know, fight happens, someone wins. It's much more complex and layered uh, than that. Every time there's, uh, I think as much as the, the movements for change, be it you know, labor or otherwise, become created with their resistance patterns, the state also becomes uh, creative with how to combat those movements. The labor movement is a very interesting example. When, uh, when in Mahalla started, the state uh, was giving in one time after uh, the other. But then it took them longer with the uh, property uh, taxes to do that. And now there has been um, a sit-in in one of the textile uh, factories in Tonka for a few months now, and the state is not doing anything. It's not crushing the sit-in, it's not going in, but it's not also giving to the demand. They're just, and quoting one of the negotiators, we're gonna leave them there to rot. Mm -hmm. And I think that complexity of the moment demands a different way of thinking. It's a different way of thinking about <coughs> politics, about the South, about the relationship between neoliberalism, the current uh, global economic crisis, and what are the alternatives uh, we're looking at. And I think we, we might uh, need to start with a couple of cases, Egypt and other places. But I think um, there's a lot of intellectual uh, homework to be done. Uh, <coughs> specifically by the left, that has not been uh, done so far. I think there is a right moment, not only in Egypt, but you know, with the, the neoliberal model <coughs> coming to the end. And I think as um, progressive social scientists, a lot of us have not put um, enough thought into what is to be done, uh, what alternatives are coming out. Uh, and I hope that this volume would be a start uh, for this kind of effort.